Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. This is my third time at this um, meeting, and it, it's a, a crucially important meeting for us, um, for obvious reasons. I don't have a lot of time, but what I want to do is, is not go into a whole lot of detail, but give you a brief overview about um, the use of transgenic mouse models in uh, prion disease um, studies. And so what I'm going to talk about, I'll give it a little bit of introduction to prions and the prion diseases, but I want to talk primarily about transgenic mouse models, and then I'll finish up uh, with some uh, uh, thoughts about um, uh, therapeutics. So our long-term goals, as uh, Yuri mentioned, is to uh, understand the mechanism of prion formation, uh, replication and evolution, uh, strains and so on, species barriers. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, all right, hope that doesn't happen again. All right, and uh, also to look at using transgenic mouse modeling to look at the mechanism of genetically um, and, um, programmed prion diseases. And one of our main goals at the moment is to identify cellular factors that might be involved in addition to the prion protein. Um, ultimately, our goal, I think everyone's goal, is, is, is really to generate effective therapeutics. By understanding these mechanisms better, that's obviously um, a way to do that, and obviously also diagnostics. So our working hypothesis is, um, is, is one that's really um, um, predominant in the field now, and that is the prion diseases are diseases of conformational change, in this case involving the prion protein, changing from a normal conformation to an abnormal conformation, and, and many people, including Byron's lab, are trying to work out the fine structure of that uh, infectious form. And that during uh, prion diseases, the conformation of the normal form changes into the abnormal form, circles to squares, and PRP scrapey, this molecule, this um, conformer, imposes its conformation or its shape onto the normal form that we all express. Everyone in this room has this prion protein and, and expresses it. It has some normal function that we don't completely understand. And I think it's worth pointing out that this is... This field is, is not a moving target. It, it, it's, it's highly fluid, and you can see this here in this timeline. You know, we've known about Scrapey for several hundreds of years. CJD was uh, identified first in the 1920s, and then throughout the, the 20th century, these major discoveries have happened, right? Kuru, transmissible mink encephalopathy, chronic wasting disease, all of these new prion diseases have come to light, including uh, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease, the source of variant CJD, and more recently, atypical forms of scrapie and bovine prions. And most recently, it's become clear that the mechanism that I just showed you is involved not only in the prion diseases, but also other more common neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and so on. But I don't have time to go into that today. So... Um, a major feature of all prion diseases is that, is that they're transmissible. We thought for many, many years that these were diseases of viral nature, but they're not. As I've told you, they're infectious proteins. Um, but in terms of experimental analysis of these tr transmissions, it's been extremely difficult over the years to study this. Obviously, in a natural host, these transmissions tend to be very long-term. They're long incubation times. Obviously, these models are not very uh, tractable. They're very expensive. Um, it's difficult to look at at-risk species, for example, horses or pigs that are not known to develop uh, prion disease but may have been exposed to infectious material. Obviously, transmission is impossible to human beings, and uh, laboratory rodents have their own special uh, problems. So just to give you some perspective, um, the, the breakthrough in, in, in human prion disease transmission came from the work of Gajasek and Joe Gibbs and his co-workers at the suggestion of Bill Hadlow the transmission of CJD and Kuru to non-human primates. And many people tried to transmit scrapie and, uh, and other prion diseases to, to mice. The, the problem here is that there's a species barrier. In other words, um, mice are not sheep, right? And they express different prion proteins. And so what happens during this process is if you attempt to take scrapie, for example, and inoculate normal laboratory rodents, it's a very difficult process. It, it tends to be very inefficient. Any mice that do develop disease do so with a long incubation time, and it's, it's basically a stochastic process. 
However, when this does happen, you can take this material, retransmit it back into mice, and now you have an adaptation event going on. So now you've made, instead of sheep prions, you now have mouse prions. So this is an example of evolution or natural selection, adaptation of the prion uh, infectious unit in this case. So that was a very nice approach. It, it lent to uh, the discovery of, uh, primarily in Edinburgh, of prion strains. What that means is that there are, like viruses, there are different isolates of prions with different biological properties. In the prion world, we characterize them in terms of their incubation time and also the neuropathology that they uh, induce in the brain. You can see here three, um, three typical strains with short, intermediate, and long incubation times and differences in pathology. And the important thing is that this is a remarkably reproducible phenomenon. These strains tend to be very stable. You can do the experiment on year one and you'll get exactly the same re result 10 years later. So, and this really uh, confused people for many years. This was the major argument that these diseases were of viral nature because if you have strain properties, how can you have that in the absence of a nucleic acid? Um, I wanted to show you because, I mean, this is what we deal with every day, um, basically how prion disease looks in, uh, in an infected animal. So these, this is a, an end-stage mouse. Uh, you can see here it's, it's unable to coordinate its movements properly. It has a wobbly gait, uh, uh, a very uh, rough coat, slowed responses. And you can see here this, what we call a plastic tail. So these are pathognomonic features, clinical features of, of prion disease in the laboratory. In addition, uh, we can study the neuropathology in the brains of these mice and also um, the biochemical properties of the prion protein in the brains of these sick animals. So we can, um, we can look, for example, at uh, the ultrastructure of the prion protein, the protease resistance of the protein, and also the deposition of this abnormal form in the brain. So I'm going to talk now about transgenic mouse modeling. What we, what we do here is we express, uh, by molecular biological techniques, uh, protein, prion proteins from different species in these mice. And what this allows us to do, as I'll show you in overview, is to, is to study human prions, scrapie or CWD, in a tractable laboratory rodent. So going back, way back, when I was working with the, the, the Prusner group in UCSF, one of the first transgenic models that we made were uh, humanized transgenic mice for obvious reasons that allowed us to study CJD and other uh, human diseases. And what we, what we do here is basically um, uh, clone and express the human prion protein gene in these mice. We engineer the nuclei, the uh, embryos of these mice to express this protein now. And, and now these mice express at high levels. And we can inoculate these mice with prions, there's no longer a species barrier. Like I told you before, CJD is very difficult to infect mice. In the case of these humanized transgenic mice, because they ex now express the human prion protein, they have no species barrier, and all of these mice develop uh, prion disease when infected with CJD or other human prions. So this was a real breakthrough for us, and it allowed us to study uh, an enormous amount of uh, uh, different human prions and led to the idea of uh, strain um, um, confirmations and so on, which I don't have time to go into today. The other aspect of this uh, kind of an engineering is that we can also study uh, genetically programmed uh, prion diseases. As you all know, hu uh, inherited human prion diseases are caused by mutations in the coding sequence for the human prion protein gene. And what we did was to engineer these mutations into mice, one of them in particular, the, the GSS mutation at codon 102, and these mice spontaneously develop a prion disorder without infection. So like uh, humans expressing the mutant form, we can study the onset of spontaneous disease in these mice as well. And my colleague, uh, um, uh, Julie Moreno, is going to talk more about this later today. So just, again, briefly, an overview, we've, we've generated a, a large number of different uh, animal models, transgenic mouse models, expressing all the, um, uh, the proteins from naturally occurring um, uh, prion diseases, uh, humans, sheep, cattle, elk, and so on. And what we can do now is in, we can challenge these mice with the corresponding prions, in, um, human prions, or sheep prions, or cattle prions, or, B, or CWD, and so on, and study 
these um, diseases in a tractable laboratory uh, setting. This also allows us to uh, engineer mice expressing other prion species of prion proteins from animals that may be at risk and test to see whether those animals develop prion disease when we inoculate them with prions from other species. And so we, we've also done that. We've also engineered um, the prion protein into uh, transgenic mice from animals that are a normal um, experimental model, so overexpressing the mouse prion protein, or more recently the bank vol prion protein, and these models have also been of, of great use. And another aspect of this is that we can look at uh, the effects of uh, subtle uh, variations in the coding of the prion protein, in other words, polymorphic variants. So, for example, you're all aware of the methionine valine polymorphism at 129. Uh, we've engineered that and other polymorphisms that also occur in other species that we can study the effects of those um, um, polymorphisms uh, on pathogenesis. So, um, okay, more recently uh, we've generated what are called uh, gene-targeted transgenic mice. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but these are much more precise models and they're giving us a lot of really important information about the pathogenesis of chronic wasting disease. Okay, so talking about chronic wasting disease, I want to I tell you uh, a little bit about our, our, work, our recent work. It gives you a, a, an idea of what we can really do with these models. So this is a rapidly emerging, very contagious disease, not only of captive animals, but also wild animals. So it's very, very difficult to control, highly contagious. It affects deer and elk and other cervid species. First identified by uh, the late Beth Williams in uh, Colorado, actually at Fort Collins. And it was confined to this area for many, many years. And now it's spread like wildfire across uh, North America. And also it's been imported accidentally into South Korea. So we generated transgenic mice expressing either deer or uh, the elk prion protein. This is work of my colleagues, um, um, uh, Rachel Angers and uh, Sean Browning. And one of the first things we asked was, is CWD a risk to humans? In other words, um, these animals are obviously hunted, their meat is consumed. And we asked if we could detect infectivity in the muscles of these uh, animals. And this was a collaboration I did with uh, Christina Sigerton, who's here today. You can see here that um, we had no trouble transmitting infectivity from the brains of these infected animals. But to our surprise, we also found that there were apparently very high levels of infectivity also in the muscle. So what this said to us was that um, people uh, consuming this material would be at risk for um, exposure to CWD prions. $64,000 question is whether or not, like BSC, oh dear, um, like BSC, which we know to be a, um, transmissible to humans in the form of variant CJD, whether or not this is also true in the case of human beings. So one important factor in understanding that is to identify whether there are different strains of CWD. And so we also use these mice to identify and characterize two distinct strains of CWD. One we call imaginatively CWD1, has short incubation times and a very distinct pathology shown here. And the other strain, CWD2, has a long incubation time. And you can see here a very different, much more diverse asymmetric pathology. And so we're, we're, um, we're studying um, whether or not these two different strains have different tropisms to different species in particular human, human beings using modeling in transgenic mice. So I mentioned about polymorphic variation. Uh, these are, are different, subtle differences in the coding sequences of these prion proteins. We've also en engineered these in mice and showed that for the most part, these are inhibitory, protective, against chronic wasting disease in, um, in these transgenic mouse models. We've done similar things with scrapie. We've engineered mice to express ovine or, or, or sheep PRP, again with this m most common polymorph polymorphism at 136, either alanine or valine. And you can see here that there's a, a really dramatic effect of this valine polymorphism compared to the alanine polymorphism. These are incubation times. There's this time along here. You can see here the valine expressing mice get sick very, very quickly, whereas the uh, alanine mice are, uh, have a much more protracted incubation time. So we're, we're able to study here um, really sub uh, subtle effects, no, uh, not subtle effects, obviously non-subtle effects of these polymorphic variations in transgenic mice. <clears throat> 
And also, we were able to look at um, what happens, and this is the normal situation in sheep, when we co-express these. And you can see here, when we co-express in these mice, that the valine uh, phenotype really wins over. Um, that, that these mice expressing A and V have a short incubation time, not a long incubation time like the, these valine mice. Okay, so I want to finish up in the, the one second that I've got left um, about some thoughts about therapeutics. So um, this goes back to work that Stan Prusner and his colleagues uh, did at UCSF, and they found that quinacrine um, uh, could inhibit or reduce the amount of uh, prions in, in, in chronically infected cells. The problem is that these were mouse prions. These were an experimental model looking at mouse infectivity. And you can see here, these are normal cells expressing, um, uh, or rather producing the prion protein, mouse prion protein. When you treat with quinacrine here, basically, we show, we agree with Stan that this, this basically eliminates um, infectivity from these cells. What we found, however, that was we, when we took cells that not now express the mouse prion protein, but now express the uh, elk or deer prion protein, when we treated those cells with quinacrine, you can see here that the levels of PRP scrapie didn't drop, they rose paradoxically. So this is a real puzzle to us. And you can see here there's about a, a, a six, uh, about a six-fold increase in the levels of quinacrine in these uh, cell cultures. And it's a dose response. You can see the more quinacrine you put in, the higher the amount of, of prions you produce. And we could titrate these as well. Um, and, and we show that in, increased titers are, are, are affected by uh, treating these cells with quinacrine. Uh, we also show that the conformation or the shape of the molecule changes subtly in response to treatment with quinacrine, suggesting that a new strain is emerging. And so to test that, we inoculated mice with quinacrine-treated prions or non-quinacrine-treated prions, and we could see a difference in the response of these mice when we treated with quinacrine, that the incubation times were, were longer, paradoxically. And also, the pathology in these mice were very different. So what this told us was that the quinacrine actually changed the strain properties of chronic wasting disease in these infected cell cultures. It didn't eliminate the prion protein, unlike uh, the case of mouse uh, prions. And so I think what this says is that we have to be very, very careful when we design approaches for therapeutics. If we're trying to develop therapeutics that target the prion protein, um, uh, in, in the case of CJD, we'd better be using a system where we can study the actual human prion protein, preferably in cell culture, transgenic mice, and then test the effect of these compounds um, on, on the actual human prion. In other words, we can't extrapolate the effects of, of, of therapeutics on experimental prions to the human setting. So I'd like to finish by thanking you for your attention and all my colleagues here. Um, I've mentioned a couple of people, Rachel Angers and uh, Sean Browning did a lot of the initial work uh, on, on this. On this. We, uh, you're going to hear from Julie Moreno uh, later today. Um, I want to thank uh, the NIH in particular, uh, the CJD Foundation as well. And I want to me mention, um, we just put on this international prion meeting at, at Fort Collins, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without uh, um, the help of our um, funding agencies. Uh, in, a, in particular, the, the CJD Foundation w was really generous in their support, so I want to reiterate my thanks uh, to them, and I'll, I'll finish now. Um, and join the, the uh, Wi-Fi <laughs> system here. <laughs> Thank you.